Hey everybody, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around for the new release rundown after Table Takes. This week we are joined by our friend Javion from Mox Boarding House. Thank you. You can Dan. let it out now. You can say what you want to <laughs> say. Happy Halloween! There you go. <laughs> yeah. You've been trying to hold that in for what, like two <laughs> minutes? <laughs> I'm so happy to be back. Thank you <coughs> for having me again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, thank I'm you excited. for joining us. I'm really excited to really? be here today. What are you excited about? We have all big board games today. Mm -hmm. So. Every single one of these, so there's, there's no small stuff. Go no, big or go happen. home. Yes, exactly. Well, first, uh, I believe you were given very explicit instructions <laughs> yep. to discuss what Mox Boarding House did during Halloween. Yes. Okay, so Halloween was yesterday. Um, we did a lot of stuff for Halloween. Anybody who came in with like a costume or anything like that, usually kids, we did trick-or-treating as part of like whole, the whole Ballard area. A lot of mm -hmm. the places in Ballard were doing trick-or-treat for kids. Um, we also had like some cool <laughs> sticker sets, some custom mocks, <clears throat> spooky stickers. Uh, we did draft and drafts, which is like beer and Magic the Gathering. We did all spooky editions of Magic, like spooky what's, sets. What's spooky beer? Well, the beer wasn't spooky, okay. but the, the Magic draft Not was. like green beer or anything? No, I don't think so. Maybe. <laughs> right, make a note of that for next year. Yeah, sure. Um, but we also did a narrative uh, tournament for Warcry. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Warhammer, mm -hmm. but like very simplified. Yep. For, Age like, of Sigmar Kill Team. Like yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted to do a, a Kill Team event that was just like an infinite zombie poxwalker horde and see how long people could survive. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Maybe next year. I love. I love survival. A year stuff from like now. That, like big hordes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Well, I have a lot of games to talk about. Great. Today, what would so. you like to go with first? I want to talk. Uh, about actually, you know, what? I'm going to try something different. Oh. Chat. You can see the games we have here. Okay. If chat would like us to skip the queue, they can engage with our content and uh, <laughs> say so in the, the, the chat. But yeah. until then, what would you like to start off I with? Talk, I want to talk about Dune. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so first, this is the what show and that I brought. What is this? So this here, this is the new copy of Dune that just came out. Yes. So this was just released. It's a remake. But I... I had to bring this copy of Dune because this is uh, like a um, like a one-off um, published version um, that, uh, before this came out. Oh, it uses the same font and everything. <coughs> yeah, so this was a version that you know was that used a lot of the same art that was based on. Oh, cool. Um, and it you know you had to buy it kind of like one-off custom before the game was available because part of the reason why people are so excited about Dune coming out. Mm -hmm is that it uh, was a hugely popular game, but it was so rare, it was so hard to get, it was out of print for so long, oh. that people were making kind of bespoke copies online. Mm. So I bought one, but then the box kind of disintegrated. Oh no. <laughs> so my, my lovely wife. <gasps> no way. Yeah, she, she painted. Oh, thank yeah. you, Nelly. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, this is this is <laughs> oh, what the, this is this is what the cover uh, of the box looked like. That's so cool. So, I had a super special edition of Dune, and now a new edition of Dune came out, so everyone can have a special edition of Dune. Oh, that's so great. Mm -hmm. I love I love the quality of like the the cards and like the pieces yep. too. They feel really nice. Yep, they're they're wood pieces, which is nice. Um, oh, man. Those ones are not. But no, these are these are mass produced. <laughs> I just I just had to bring uh, the special copy of Dune to show off. That's awesome. That's so cool. Thank you, Nelly. So normal Dune, <laughs> normal plebeian Dune. Yes. Uh, so Dune. this has just come out. Like it, I think we picked up this copy from Ballard mm -hmm. Wednesday. I think is what we did. Yeah. So I think it was like they were oh, they were okay. putting it on the shelf on Wednesday. When ah, we cool, there. cool, awesome. Um, so this is your copy. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, good. Yep. Yep, I figured it was open, so it would. Uh, I didn't know if you guys had a library copy. Not yet. Basically. I don't think we were gonna get one. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what it's I figured. It's a lot of pieces. It's a very expensive game. It takes so long to play. Well, it's it, no, it's not an expensive game. It was only like thirty-five dollars. Oh, what? Yeah, oh. yeah. I thought it was like fifty or something. I know. I was I was shocked. Um, but yes, there are uh, a whole lot of pieces. Oh, well, that's a very pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for those of you who haven't played Dune already. Um, or you know, just want to know more about you know refreshing the rules in your mind or something like that. Dune is a huge game of conquest, diplomacy, and betrayal. Love so, it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell it me is, more about betrayal. It's this massive game with this huge game board everybody's playing on, 
and you've got your faction with like special abilities and you're moving around trying to collect spice, spend spice on different things, fighting people, and you're basically just trying to take control of three of these different five locations where people are gonna be like fighting over to win the game. So if you have a certain number of them, you'll either automatically win or you might have your own different win condition depending on which faction you're playing, how complex of the game you're playing, because there's variants and stuff like that. You can play an advanced game. There's with a treachery powers. deck. Tre there's a treachery deck. There's a traitor deck, which is completely different. There's a spice deck. There's a lot of different decks of cards in this game. It's a, it's a very, very heavy the game. The traitor deck. Yeah. It's a very Derek game. <laughs> there's, um, there's a traitor deck where you're getting lots of different traitors. Wherein, you, if you're going after like a certain faction that's close by and you want to fight them, you'll have a traitor. Wherein, like, if they're choosing one of their leaders mm -hmm. from yeah. their faction, so like, every army can theoretically send a leader out. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. But every other faction might have that leader as a traitor exactly. that they could deploy against them. Right. Or you and I could form an alliance, and you could tell me that you have the traitor card for one of my troops, so then I know that he's loyal. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's wheels within wheels and plans within yes. plans. Yes, there's so much negotiating, <coughs> so much <coughs> politics and nuance to the mm -hmm. game. There's a lot of subterfuge where yep. you're like going to betray people that you had alliances with by attacking them or moving to the same space with them and being like, well, I mean, I, I needed to get through the space. I said it was an alliance last turn. Together. I didn't say it was this turn. <laughs> yeah, so Chad yeah. has noted that this is a maximum spite game. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, is, it is very much a war game. Yeah, but chat, it's also chat wants to know too. what if you can play the Shai Halud, which is the giant worm. Uh, no, uh, I you, don't you, think no, so. No, but the Fremen should have the ability to ride the worm yes. around. I yes, think. the worm does appear, and you do. Yes, the Fremen get to ride it around, and it does cause mayhem. Yeah. <laughs> well, so like <coughs> each of these six factions. Six? Yep, yeah, there are six, six of them. Plays up to um, six players. Each of the six factions has different abilities. Yes. Uh, you know, you have like the Spacing Guild, where I believe every time that you uh, send people to the planet, mm -hmm. uh, instead of paying the bank, you pay this one player. Exactly. Because they're the one shipping. Exactly. Or you have the Emperor, who just has lots of spice. You mm -hmm. play the Harkonnen, who have lots of spies and traitors. Yes. Maybe I'll play them. Yes. Um, but just as like a, an example of kind of a crazy way that these rules work sometimes, is the Bene Gesserit, uh, at the beginning of the game, mm -hmm. they pick another player, and if that player wins, and they had picked them, then the Bene Gesserit win instead. Exactly. Because it was all their plan all along. And it's not just like which faction, you're also picking mm -hmm. which turn they're going to win as mm -hmm. well. So it's very specific to when you think they're going to win and who you think is going to win. So you mm -hmm. can sort of help them along, mm -hmm. or try to do that subtly without m mentioning it, or try like some double bluff action, things like that. Yep. Yeah. So I was trying to explain this to Emma earlier. You know, she was asking how similar it is to, say, Rising Sun or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I would say that I, I think this is, like, they're in the same genre. Right. Um, but Rising Sun, I think, is just a flat-out simpler game. Sure, absolutely. Um, both in terms of powers and the mechanics and things like that. And understanding the board state mm -hmm. and all of that, yeah. Rising Sun has a lot of the same things in terms of like look how the combat works. So you're choosing how much you're going to commit to the combat mm -hmm. before it happens. It has to happen if you're in the same location as somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They feel very similar, I think. I think but so Rising too. Sun, I think, is just a, a much uh, simpler version. Exactly, yeah. This one has so many different things involved. It is pretty what? close to, f I mean, the, the box says 120 minutes plus. But I feel like it's closer to like three to four hours, sometimes even goes up to six hours, mm -hmm. depending on how long the game goes on, how well everybody knows the game. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's so much beyond just you know, how to win and the basic actions. There's mm -hmm. also the, the negotiation, the politics between talking between players. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of decisions involved. There's a lot of auctions that go on. You have to make a lot of decisions based on where you're at or where you think other people are at, what mm -hmm. you think they're going to do versus what you're going to do. But I think the other thing to keep in mind as we're talking about how complicated this game is, is that it's not that the rules are the most complex. Like, there are rule books that are thicker. Right. Um, yeah. And th this rule book, you know, is what, 24 pages. And they do have a quick start mm -hmm. guide, yep. too. Well, that's what I was going to emphasize. Like, you know, this is a 24-page rule book, but it includes a synopsis of the novel. It includes, 
you know, a page spread for each faction. Right. Um, so it's not, you know, super compact. Right. A lot of this material you don't necessarily need to read in your first playthrough. They have the quick start guide to kind of get you up and going. Yeah. This is a complicated game, not because there are a million rules. There are a lot, but not <laughs> the yeah. most complicated. Right. It's a complicated game because of the way those rules interact with exactly. each other and with the other players. Exactly. And I should also mention that you don't need to know a whole lot about the books. You haven't have you don't have to have read all of them mm -hmm. to be able to play the game. It does give a little bit more flavor to mm -hmm. it, and you kind of understand the theming a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Like why the Bene Gesserit get to predict those kinds of things, mm -hmm. or why the Harkonnen are so good at betrayal. But at the end of the day, all of the rules are designed for people who have not read it, or to be more fun for people who have you know read the books, really like it. Mm -hmm. I really hope that they come up with some expansions or something like that in the future, so well, they can incorporate some of the weirder stuff that goes on in the books. <coughs> so this this game came out uh, the seventies, I think. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, ago. Yeah, so it's a very old game, um, but they they didn't fundamentally change anything. But I believe they revised some of the rules, right. and over the years it had gotten like more and more kind of like fan revisions. Mm -hmm. um, like fan rules were added to modify things, improve things, and I, from what I understand, they incorporated and improved on most of those in here as well. Right. So this is kind of like the new definitive edition of it. Yes. Um, yeah. And I'm really excited just because of the number of people who have been so excited about it finally coming back out, finally yeah. being available again. Yeah, for the people who wanted it but couldn't get it, now you it actually can. It was definitely like a white whale of a game people were hunting. Yeah, absolutely. And to speak to its popularity, we had so many people requesting this game all the time. And we have a lot of copies at Mox, so if you're looking for this game, we definitely have it in stock. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that is Dune. That's going to be my pick of the week because I already bought it. All right, awesome. What does the chat say we should pick next? Uh, uh, I don't think they have said so. I think they are uh, screaming about amok, amok. <laughs> okay. um, so I think chaos has ensued in chat. All right, well, I'm what just going to pick another next? game to go with then. All right, so like I said, we got all big games today. And this this one just might be the biggest one. I don't know. <coughs> Tapestry and Dune might be fighting for that, Wait, for that hold one. On. But this game, this cute, adorable game with the smiling, happy spaceman on it? Yeah. It, it looks pretty simple from, from the box. <coughs> Not on the back. And on the back, it, when I first saw it, I thought like, oh, maybe it's kind of got some like complexity to it. Like now, that light now that they've rules, properly focused the camera, I'm going to spin it. Mm -hmm. Some light rules to it, but this game is huge. <coughs> there is a lot of complexity to it. So basically what you're doing is you are a fledgling space explorer team. Mm -hmm. You're in the 50s and the 60s. You're here for the space race. You're trying to get a bunch of stuff into space. Mm -hmm. And the way the game works is it sort of fantasizes space, or at least what it could have been back then. It's not an entirely accurate historical no. representation of the engineering Thankfully, challenges? No, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so much more fictional and sure. whimsical in that kind of way, but it's also a kind of serious game. Um, what you're doing is you're trying to build a rocket. You're also trying to upgrade that rocket. You want it to be able to fly fast. You also want it to be able to carry more expensive missions. You also want it to be able to carry lots of extra stuff, you know, be able to carry lots of weight. So what you're doing is you start off by drafting these specialists who are going to help you figure out what you're going to be able to do on that turn and give you extra bonuses, make things cheaper for you, give you a little so bit extra spending So you're kind of like building money. your crew, your engineering staff? Exactly. That's okay. the first thing you're doing. You're drafting those kinds of things. So maybe I have some cards. I'll choose one I want to keep. You'll pass them see, down. Uh, see, now I'm just imagining, uh, like, uh, trying to figure out whether the US or Russia or China gets, like, a first round draft pick <laughs> in, like, the new graduating class of engineers or something like that. Well, thankfully, this game actually goes up to four players. You don't have to choose between those two pl pl um, people. You sure. can just, and it also doesn't have, like, an Earth or like a like a map on the board, or anything like that. You're really just working with resources and space. So after you've drafted those specialists, you're deciding what actions you're going to take during the game, what cards you're going to take on, what missions you're going to take on. You're building your rocket up so you can take on better and better missions, but mm -hmm. you start off it's sort of a slow ramp. You only get a couple of different things. Your your capacity for the rockets or the satellites you can send into space are very low. 
So what are, are what are the missions that you're going on? Are you just launching satellites, basically? Well, your missions are to establish contact with aliens oh, okay. or create orbital so what, so tra um, trade yeah, just bases be clear. and things when like that. When you said it was fantastical, you meant that. I Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's sort of romanticizing what it could have been. Um, all the different actions that you're taking and stuff like that, the missions that you're taking on, some of them a little bit more reasonable than others. Um, in any case, you're trying to collect different sets of cards because mm -hmm. the, the different like space cards or mission cards that you're going to take on will change win conditions for you. Mm -hmm. You're trying to collect victory points, and whoever gets the most by the end of the game is the winner, but you'll collect points in different ways. Like There are different colored cards or mm -hmm. mission cards that you can collect, and some of them you do need to collect in order to actually get a certain amount of points, but mm -hmm. some of them are extraneous, <coughs> but collecting a lot of them might get you more points. So from the complication the you're the describing, and the theme, and the back of the box, this, this vaguely reminds me of um, Terraforming Mars. It should. There's, there's a lot of So they're, they're like comfortable cousins kind of thing? You're not really turning a place into a, another place, sure. <laughs> like in Terraforming Mars, but you have your own sort of like business, your own does, sort does of it, rockets and stuff that you're setting up. the same engine building element? Kind of. Okay. Um, I think the theming is a little is, is pretty different. Um, in Terraforming Mars, you're not really wor worried about what's going where. You're mm -hmm. worried about a place. Okay. And here, you're worrying about your resources. Okay. Your specialists. So this is a little your more team. resource management as yeah. opposed to because like Terraforming Mars is very much build your tableau yeah. and then build your engine that will transform resources into resources. Right. This is more about resource generation than an expenditure. Sure. Okay. Terraforming Mars is much more streamlined. Everything is, I wouldn't say straightforward, but everything works together in a very cohesive way. As long as you're not bad at it. Yeah, exactly. In liftoff, you're trying to build your rocket so that it has enough capacity to take on better missions, but mm -hmm. you're also trying to get the right specialists sure. so that those missions, when you're trying to carry them out, you can also carry off um, different well, satellites and mm -hmm. other well, tonnage, really. You're trying to build the capacity of your rocket, but you can't do that without getting the right specialists. Mm -hmm. And specialists will lower the costs of different things, or you'll need to pay, pay extra money to upgrade your rockets. So, so I mean, a lot of stuff yeah. is just it's, it's circling around. It sounds like around. a lot of uh, kind of um, delivery economic um, yes. route building games. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. it ends up being a game where you're trying not to spend too much money, but you need to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you need a lot more money, but to get that money, you need to do a lot of things that cost money. So <laughs> there's, it's all working around Are there itself. any other games that you would say would be similar to this? Uh, well, Terraform Mars is actually a good one, I, okay. I'd say. Z-Man Games has also made some other games that are really popular. So if you like a lot of Z-Man games, mm -hmm. I would try those out. Mm -hmm. If you like really complex, huge games, like uh, like Terra Mystica mm -hmm. or Gaia Project, okay. the, the components and the different resources that you're managing, it takes a lot of knowledge about the game. So if you're really into like heavy board games, I would check mm -hmm. this one out. Okay, Great. What's the spite level? What's the interaction? Because a lot of Euro games don't have a whole lot of that. Yeah, well, this one, I would say you're worrying about yourself a little bit more than okay. you're worrying about other people. So it's kind of like Terraforming Mars in that sense. Yeah, okay. I, think, I think there's just so much that you need and so much that you don't have that mm -hmm. you're working towards. It's really hard to think about the board state mm -hmm. when it comes to what other people are doing. So I would give it a relatively low spite level, okay. although you are competing for different Mm, market cards that are out on the yeah. board. You're trying it, to get to... It doesn't sound like there's a lot of direct interaction. Yeah, Okay. exactly. Great. All right, then. What is next? Let's do... I want to reach over there and take the Pop Funko game. This is Funkoverse. Funkoverse, Funkoverse. is a strategy game. Hey, look, you could be in the... <laughs> That was silly. <laughs> I know. Um, you can We're hard hitting journalists here. <laughs> so uh, at first glance, uh, this game kind of looks like a battle game. You got DC heroes and villains, and you're going to be playing with a lot of different miniatures um, based in the DC universe. Uh, it's a very expandable game, and uh, just because these are superheroes doesn't mean it is a straight up combat game. Maybe the first time you play it, you play the tutorial game where the object is to knock down and then knock out one of your opponents, which comes down to a lot of special abilities and rolling dice and things like that. Dice, you say? I see why you like this game. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, this, this game, the combat, is um, based in dice rolling to see if you can defend or attack and things like that. But for the most part, 
after you play the tutorial game, it's really a point-based strategy game. Mm -hmm. You're trying to collect objectives and earn points by maybe collecting flags or holding on to certain locations longer uh, than I'd your like to correct do. chat. Um, there is a Golden Girls version of this. We just don't have it with us. Exactly. Uh, like that is one of the crazy things about these Funkoverse games. Uh, is it? You, it's a million IPs. Exactly. Right? Golden Girls are apparently the hot OP faction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it has anything from like Rick and Morty mm -hmm. to Harry Potter and even Golden Girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll get and to play. They all as they all use the same rules, so you can all kind of yeah. mix and match and play. And they all come you, with their own scenarios. You and just course, brought too. the 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 big the, what, the version Batman with core set players, basically. Yeah. So this one you can play up to four players because it comes with four miniatures. But mm -hmm. if you wanted to get the Golden Girls by itself, you can't. You don't need the base game in order to play with them. It comes with their own board and own scenarios as well. Uh, because, like I said, it's not just a combat game, mm -hmm. even though Batgirl has a flying kick and you know uh, Harley Quinn has her giant mallet. You're, you can, and a lot of it comes down to a lot of combat, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's a strategy yeah. game. Like com uh, there was some very interesting touches here um, in that uh, there's like a cooldown and a respawning mechanic. Right. So <clears throat> it's basically a miniatures game. Yes. You're using your miniatures, you're sending them across the board, they're taking over territory, but you that's not how you win just by you can't not win, always. you can't win by knocking out your opponent unless that's the scenario you're playing. Sometimes you'll gain points by knocking mm -hmm. down your opponents, but once you've played like some of the scenarios, you'll see that a lot of the points that you'll get come down to like trying taking, to hold positions yep, taking or objectives, certain objectives, picking things up, things yeah, like that. Collecting accomplishing stuff. a task. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really intriguing to me because this is basically a my first <coughs> uh, miniatures game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have a grid; it's grid based. You get to move around. You get to use the characters you love, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like just as deep and just as complex as uh, you know other miniature games can be. Yeah, when you get down to or it, you're worried a lot about yeah the tactics of where you're going to move your miniatures to or your characters. Mm -hmm. um, how you're going to use their abilities, which ones you're going to use, and knowing what your opponent's uh, abilities are and their cooldowns and stuff like that, mm -hmm. positioning and that kind of strategy is really what a lot of this comes down to. And the mechanics for the the heroes that I found really intriguing um, is again you have that respawn mechanic. Right. So when you finally defeat a villain or a hero, they what they're put on their track here, mm -hmm. and then they move off the track every well, time. Well, no, no. Um, the, do they respawn automatically? The, I can't remember. The the heroes don't, okay. but they have their own little exhaustion markers and yep. stuff like that. So if they're knocked down, they can't be used until mm -hmm. this marker goes away. But you also have these ability tokens. Yep. And the abilities have different potency. So like the more powerful it is, the higher up on the cooldown track it'll mm -hmm. be. The longer it'll take before you can use it again. Yep. The least power, less powerful it is, the sooner you'll be able to use it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you put it at whatever point on the track it is. Each turn it goes down one, exactly. then you get it back. Right. Um, so like, they certainly seem to pull a lot from a bunch of different genres of games together to yeah. then play with these heroes. It's an objective-based game that uses dice to handle the combat and mm -hmm. a cooldown tracker to handle the abilities. It's a pretty simple game, especially when you're just playing the tutorial game. I've seen a lot of families being able to play this together. I was able to hand it off to them while I was working at Mox. And people were able to like show their kids, like, hey, this is what your abilities are, this is what they do. If you want to do this, all you got to do is that. Very, like, it was very quick to learn. I think yeah. I got like a 10-minute summary and then was playing. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, it's, it comes down to only a couple of different actions. They've got some reference cards to make it easier for you to learn. Mm -hmm. And if you just play the tutorial game, you'll get all the basics down so that you can play the scenarios pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And once you get to play with the other uh, expansions and the other heroes, you'll have all the basics down, the scenarios will be different, and it'll all feel very thematic to the characters that you're playing, or at least the location that you're playing at. Because you might want to take Rick, <laughs> um, uh, Sanchez, I think, from Rick and Morty, and then play him against Rose, and then see which one of them will come out on top with collecting different like tokens around the board Clearly or something Rose. like that. Of, of course, absolutely. I think anybody would agree with you there. <laughs> So what is the spite level for this game? Well, because it is a strategy game based on objectives, you're going to have to do a lot of combat. You're going to have to maneuver around your opponents. Mm -hmm. Pretty high spite level, considering well, you're knocking down your opponents and I, making them I would, useless for a little while. Uh, well, it's, it's weird. Like I would say that it's, it's a very directly competitive game. Yeah. But it, it doesn't feel super spitey to me, partly because of the adorable 
pop figures, right? Which are it's worth noting are slightly smaller than normal pop figures, mm. so they're you don't use just the, the standard Funko that you would buy in the store. Sure. Um, but I think maybe partly because of that, but also partly because of the respawn mechanic. Sure. Um, yeah. It doesn't feel super spiteful. Like you've killed my my model. Yeah. It's not out. It's just delayed. It's very competitive, but I wouldn't say it's mean. <laughs> Nobody's gonna walk away from it angry unless you end up cheating or something like that, Unless you have like other that, problems. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Will was asking about comparing this to Unmatched, mm. um, which is from Restoration yeah. Games. Yeah, Unmatched but is another battle game. Uh, Unmatched, Unmatched is, seems much more complicated. Uh, actually, no, I, no? Would, I wouldn't say that. I think okay. this one ends up being a little bit more complicated okay. because of the scenarios. Oh, okay. In Unmatched, you're just trying to beat your opponents up. <laughs> so as soon as you knock them completely out of the game, you win. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this one, you don't have to knock down your opponents, but it'll definitely make things a lot easier. And a lot of times, it'll actually earn you points. But it's not the objective. Mm -hmm. um, they don't even use like the term like fighting or battle anywhere in the game or, or at combat. You're doing challenges, and you're trying to knock them down or knock them out. So it's a lot more family friendly as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's definitely open to a lot of, well, anything that Pop Funko does can conceivably put, be put into the game. And un but unmatched, you can't is, unmatched is definitely going the non-infringing IP yeah. public public domain. Lots of different like literary references and fiction and Sasquatch. stuff like that. So it's going all over the map for, for things. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one is relegated to like pop culture stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's very important that you know you can't just take any of your Pop Funko figurines that you might have lying around and add them in. They'll be stand-ins for other characters that you have, but you can't just like take Steven Universe Pop Funkos or like Dragon Ball Z um, figures and then pop them in. Unless you want to homebrew some rules. Yeah, which you we can do that. Fully support. Of course, absolutely. Um, you'll just have to wait until they make supplements for them if you want something official. Yeah, so I would recommend this for pretty a young audience, I think. Um, once you get into the scenarios, that might get a little bit tri um, hairy, but for the most part, I've, I've seen a lot of you know, big group families. Well, and I mean, it, but it sounds like you could just you could buy this. Yeah. Play it with your kids for just a, a like a straight up brawl. Yeah, exactly. But then play it with your older friends for a more complicated objective based scenario. Totally. Yeah. And for people who are into more hardcore gaming, using the scenarios or just picking out your favorite, you know, characters from your favorite movies or TV shows or whatever. Mm -hmm and playing those against each other, I've seen all different kinds of age ranges enjoy this game. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for something a little bit more casual miniatures game. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the real key is going to be what Funkos they put out for it. Right, because, exactly. Because uh, the same with Funko. It, like, a lot of the Funko Pops people are a little dismissive of, or they're sure. like, I don't get why you get it. And then that Funko is released that for the one movie that they absolutely love. Exactly. And then they're a huge, avid Funko fan. I know I have like dozens of them just as gifts that people gave, gave me because they saw how much I love like Steven Universe or Inside Out and stuff like I've that. I've got a little so. Oryx, I think, on my shelf. Oh, cool. <laughs> Any vampires? Mm, I don't <laughs> know. They haven't done a vampire crossover, but I would be happy to buy a bunch of Funko Pops of The World of Darkness. <laughs> All right. Well, um, no, they just came out with Dune Funko Pops, classic. Oh, uh, really? The, yeah, the the old oh. old Dune movie. They're labeled Dune Classic, which suggests that they will have Dune New Dune. Oh new man. Dune. Well, I would, I'm I would just love gonna to predict. see that. I'm gonna predict. I would love to see that. Well, um, that's that's Pop Funko Verse. Uh, mm -hmm. Check it out if you <laughs> really want to play some light miniatures gaming. Um, next up, I would like to talk about Mega City. Okay. Now this is. I, I, know I think I said, we talked about the Kickstarter for this. Yeah. I know I said that Liftoff is probably the biggest game, and I just meant in terms of like complexity. This one is the largest game that I brought today. Even a Tapestry might beat it. Oh, man. I want to compare it, actually. Oh, well, it's a little taller. Yep. Oh, man. OK, so Slightly I guess Tapestry is a little bit bigger. Hey, look at you. <laughs> Mega City Oceania is a dexterity-based. Oh, boy. <laughs> resource management uh, city building game. You are trying to take these platforms. What the hell? And these building resources and city plans, combining all that stuff together to build structures according to very specific specifications that will earn you victory points. Once you've done that, you'll actually add it 
by sliding, deli literally delivering a building <laughs> into the city um, from your side of the board to the center. So everybody's building this big city. You're going to have together. to measure who's building is taller, aren't you? These are rulers specifically based to see who has the tallest building yep. or to see if you've met the requirements of that specific city plan. This is a very immersive, a very thematic yeah. well, it, city it, building it game. It looks like we just broke into uh, a scrapyard and decided to build a city out of what we found there. A floating, a floating ocean city built from it's, scrapyard pieces. It's definitely very unique pieces. Uh, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend building an actual right, <laughs> skyscraper out of this kind of stuff. So, like, so, <laughs> so, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with like a card like this, right? Yep. Okay. So, uh, in this card, it's kind of hard to see, but you like you can see on this one maybe here. Um, you're supposed to build a couple different levels, like so. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, so I need a, this piece, and I need an. Uh, that's close enough. I'm gonna go with that one. Yeah. Can you um, just can you just say close enough? Well. Or do you have to get that exact piece? <laughs> no. So, you don't literally have to have the exact pieces on the card. Good, because I don't. <laughs> what you do is you pull random pieces out of a bag, and on the left side of the card, it'll tell you how many millimeters high it has to be. And on the right side of the card, it'll tell me how many pieces minimum you have to place okay. into that um, space. And if okay. it says the number plus, that means you can build it at that height or more, okay. or with that many pieces okay. or more. Okay. Then at the bottom, all that's telling you is a very specific type of building you have to make. Whereas um, some of them, like this one, say you have to have an awning, which means or an, ar an archway. So the there has to be mean? a hole. That one means there's no restrictions whatsoever. Oh, okay. I was like, so you don't have to worry about use it. Use six pieces to not build a building? <laughs> use six pieces to build a building okay. without any so restrictions. So this would be the archway thing. That's an archway. Okay. So, um, so this thing I've done here looks like it meets these requirements? Uh, I yeah. Five pieces. Almost. So what that's depicting there is saying that you have to have it cover up one of the vents oh, okay. on the yeah, little tile. Oh, so. Right. so I should have built <laughs> this on one of these tiles. Yes, but you also have to have the specific color of platform of the the, the city plan that you're okay. that you're building. So right, right so now I'm, you, you don't have the right color. Whatever, for messing it. everything up. <laughs> so I would build this. We would all agree that this is the <coughs> the best junkyard skyscraper we've ever seen. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then I would have to do like push this and deliver it to the center of the table. It's got to connect with the city center. <laughs> without it. falling over. So while you're building this, you can let other people play the game and then build it on your own time. But as soon as somebody starts on their Sliding. turn and says, I'm delivering, everybody stops building. They watch. You know, you measure everything up to make sure it's the right height. Yep. Um, and the number of millimeters is also the number of floors. You can have like a 35, 45, well, 55 so story building. Do we, are we measuring from the table or from the tile? Uh, it's from the table. Yeah. OK. So. Because you don't want to mess with the building. It's about 60 millimeters. That is a 64 junkyard skyscraper. Yeah. Nailed it. It's pretty big. How I'm many, very so proud. <laughs> <laughs> how many tiles do you, how many pieces do you draw when you go to build it? So it depends. Uh, if you're looking for a very specific building type, um, then you might just declare, I'm choosing glass. And so you look for one of the clear ones, right? So you search the bag for the piece, and then you pull it out. Uh -huh. Or if you just want random pieces out of the bag, you can actually get three of them at a time. So Dumpster just diving. Randomly grab stuff out of there. Are you able? Are you allowed to feel for a piece that you want? No, not at all. But thankfully, the f the texture of all of them is almost identical. Yeah, but you could do this. Yeah, but the, shape. the way they built them was so that it it looks different, but it doesn't feel totally okay. different. All right. So you won't be able to like gain the system. Now you'll be able to feel You're like saying the I shape. Can't cheat? You're saying I can't, I can't be a traitor? Because I will find a way. <laughs> you, I absolutely believe you, Derek. I have full faith that you can cheat your way into anything you wanted. In this game, if you don't want to cheat, oh, you don't have to. <laughs> that's what happens to cheaters. Yeah. If the, if the building falls over while you're building it, that's fine. That's okay. totally fine. But if those you're delivering workers, Those it, workers don't matter. Yeah, it's exactly. It's only when you have the press conference to show that you're delivering the building that the press are paying attention. Exactly. Got it. If, okay. you, if you knock over your building while you're building it, just try again until you get it the way you want it to. And, be, and they even have some building tips for you. Mm -hmm. But while you're delivering it, it topples, if it topples over, then it's like, oh, well, I forfeit my turn. Uh, I don't get to deliver it. I'll have to start over again. Is there an action card where you can play like OSHA violation? No. To, <laughs> no? Oh, okay. oh, no. That'd be terrible. <laughs> Um, but there are different like goals. 
Like for instance, whoever has like the tallest building will get some extra victory points. Uh, whoever um, builds a building next to parks will end up getting extra points at the end of the game. So there are some different things that you're competing for. Very cute. Yeah, but if somebody has like the tallest building and ac accident gets accidentally gets toppled over, then that building just goes away. That's unfortunate. Um, the tallest building wait a minute. token goes wait, away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So if someone's beating you for tallest building, yep. you could just build a really crappy building and then deliver it really hard? You should be ashamed of yourself, Derek. That's that's awful. Why would you do that? <laughs> it's not in the spirit of this game. You sure uh, that's not I would, the spirit? I wouldn't I recommend just... anybody knock over somebody else's building just so you can earn points. It's, it's very sure? diabolical. Sure? I, I, I'm positive. That's, that's a very terrible uh, idea. <laughs> um, it, it punishes the player who actually built the tallest building. Yeah, that's and what I'm saying. It just creates bad buildings all around, so just don't do it. <laughs> so you're saying there's the opportunity for spite, but it's not intended. It's not intended, no. Um, however, you are competing for different, there's other ways to, to do spite. Like for instance, if you see that somebody has taken a specific colored platform and there's a really good building plan out for them, you mm -hmm. could just be like, well, I'll take that. Or you can spend a whole action just to move that building type to the back of the stack so that they have to wait until all the other buildings get made before they can use that one again. Okay. Yeah. Or you can compete with them for the tallest building and be like, well, mine's taller now just by like two millimeters. So Yeah, especially if you <laughs> deliver real hard. I don't recommend it. Please please don't ruin your friendship. Just to clarify, this game. you don't recommend, <laughs> but you don't forbid. <laughs> Look, I, I can't come over to your house and like stop you from building buildings and slamming it into Look, other people's buildings. there ain't no rule that say a dog can't play basketball, so. Use your best judgment. Play within the spirit of the game, and everybody will have fun. <laughs> yeah, so whoever gets the most points will end up yep. winning. It seems like a very, um, very cute game. It's it's very cute. It's also very fun to play, especially with, like de dexterity games. It does sound like it requires a stable table. Yeah, ours is a little wobbly, so I'm worried about some of the ones that are hanging off the edge over here. But uh, yeah, you can play on the floor, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> As long as as long as you're not like you know, shaking the table or like purposefully like mishandling the pieces, you should be fine. What? No, it was an accident. Mm -hmm. Box toot. <laughs> I would recommend right, so that uh, is Mega City. Oceana. Mega City for people who like city building games. Mm -hmm. So if you like suburbia, Dexter a very or, um, cute dexterity, fun dexterity game. Yeah, I think. like like Copenhagen. Yeah. You can like kinda, dexterity if you, games. If you see the back of the box, you can kind of see the kinds of buildings that you can build. Yeah, they're very wacky. Um, if you like Jenga, or if you like, um, I don't know, other si like city building games and stuff like that, or like uh, like suspense stuff that hinges on your ability to like to have a steady hand, I would definitely check out Mega City. Super fun. What's All next? Right. Let's talk about Tapestry. All right, the official winner for largest box. Yes, <laughs> Tapestry is a civilization game that plays one to five players. Um, it is a massive game of building out your structure, or not your structure, sorry, your own city, mm -hmm. your capital city, while also you have this big board in the center of the table mm -hmm. where you're trying to place different tiles and outposts on those tiles. Mm -hmm. Everybody starts in a different section based on the civilization that they choose, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of civilizations to choose from. Uh, I think like Somewhere close to like 18, uh, over mm -hmm. a dozen for sure. Well, so this is from Stonemeyer who did yeah. um, um, uh, Scythe. Wingspan and Scythe most recently. Yeah, so it, this game is very similar to Scythe in that the actions that you take, they're very simple. Usually only one of two things. Mm -hmm. this, the rules, pretty simple and straightforward. However, it ends up being a complex game because like we were talking about with Dune, uh, everything works together in various different ways, and there's lots of different things that can happen and as a result cards. of your actions. No, no? there are no traitors. You can't, cards. like, when you build a building and then I'd be like, haha, that was my traitor. No. no that's true. But what you can do is you can invade other people's outposts and then topple them over to place your own on top of that mm -hmm. tile. In which case, you end up collecting all the benefits and rewards of that tile. Mm -hmm. um, some people actually get extra bonus points for being the first one to topple over somebody's outposts. There are four different tracks that you can go off of to build your civilization. Mm -hmm. There's exploration, which is the building out on the board. Um, there is science, well not science, I would say um, technology, okay. where you're building lots of permanent upgrades for your civilization. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, military, 
where you're trying to get lots of outposts and build uh, lots of defenses on the map. And actually, there is science where you're trying to make lots of developments in order to get extra bonuses on the other tracks, mm -hmm. as well as get developments for your civilization. Sure. So you'll you typically be choosing one of those four tracks while you're collecting lots of resources to pay for your upgrades along those tracks. Mm -hmm. That does sound a lot like Scythe, where yeah. uh, you have a relatively clear, straightforward individual path, Yes. but there are multiple kind of tracks to victory. Yeah, the actions are simple. It's just what you do and how you react to what other people are doing mm -hmm. that makes the game a little bit more complicated. So they have a ta uh, a Autome Factory, yeah. So it looks like it has a single player mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you just playing against an AI deck, basically? Yes. Oh, um, okay. Certain spaces will become inaccessible to you. Um, after a certain number of turns, you'll see whether or not you beat the AI. Yeah, that's Excuse another me. another thing that they did in Scythe. Yeah. Um, I think they just borrowed a lot of the things from it. And it shows, because Scythe was a huge bestseller, and mm -hmm. still is, and I, I believe Tapestry, we just had I don't know, like some something close to like a dozen people asking for it at, at our store. So very, very popular game. It has yep. a, a quite a history with, um, well, all the hype surrounding it since it was like uh, announced earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was a very short window. It was it. a very short window from when he announced it to when it was out, yeah. relative to a lot of other board games. Yeah, um, a lot of people were putting reviews out saying that it was amazing. Some people mm -hmm. were saying that it was garbage. Some people really? were in the, on the people fence. People were divided. Yeah, shocked. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a pretty divisive game. A lot of people will play through one specific track. Like I might play with just military, and I'll convince everybody playing the game that military is the best way to win the game. It's broken. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to play it. Then the next time I play it, I might focus on exploration, and that might be like the overwhelming majority. I might soar ahead far beyond everybody else's expectations and end up winning that way. So it's a very well balanced game, but it ends up having lots of different strategies that mm -hmm. you can take on, which mm -hmm. ends up making the strategy really, really in depth. I think it's a super fun game. Um, I think because have, I played Scythe so much, have I really you, have enjoyed it. I haven't had a chance to play it. I, I've watched a lot of people play it, and it just got released today at our store. So I was I'm just wondering how, how, how accurate you think the 120 minute Very cap accurate. max. Very okay. accurate. I would say it's also kind of, um, it can it can go f even further than that if you have a lot of people who have played a lot of these games before, or if people um, who, who haven't. Once you've played Tapestry enough, you can sort of speed up the process yeah, yeah. of it just, you know, you know, decision making, but it, it teaching not, the game it, takes yeah, a while. Yeah, it says 90 to 120 minutes in the back, yeah. um, which seems short for a game that looks like this. But if you think that's pretty accurate, then, um, that's pretty solid, because I think that's, that's going to be shorter than Dune or probably a first game of Scythe or things yeah. like that. The game will only end when you have finished your era uh, or your certain number of eras when you got into the final era, but it will end at different times for different players. Mm -hmm. Some people might be developing their stuff a lot slower than you do. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll gain certain bonuses for going up the track faster, mm -hmm. which will also make you end the game for yourself faster. Mm -hmm. But other people might be a little bit slower developing so, a little bit sl more so slowly. So then it, it, most games, once the first player has kind of like completed their task, then that like initiates end game. Maybe everybody gets one more round or something like that. Right. Is that not the case? Not the case so, at all. So everybody gets a full run of their civilization's window, exactly. basically? You get to finish the game when it's time, when you've developed your city as far as it can go. It's a very interesting catch-up mechanic. Yeah. Because the opportunity for one player to kind of do as much as they want without interference at the end of the game can, can cause a pretty big swing. Exactly. But... The thing is, you can't stall the game for too long sure. because as you develop certain tracks on the board, you'll move up the era track as sure. well. Sure. Um, as you're collecting income for your different things, it might take you a little bit longer to move up the era. Yeah. It doesn't sound like you can farm points, but it sounds like right. if if you're left in the dust and everybody else finishes early, right. that doesn't necessarily mean you're out. Doesn't mean that you're out. It actually gives you a little bit more information to work with because you know exactly how many points somebody else has. If you're going to spend the time to look at, okay, you've got this, you've got these many points for that, you're going to score this at the end, that kind of thing. So, other than Scythe, what games do and like? And to be clear, we're saying it's similar to Scythe, but it it's very different. It seems to be much less military, and even right. even Scythe was nowhere near as combatty as it looks in some ways. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this, one this this seems to be further away. Even from further that. away from combat. Um, yeah. But other than Scythe, any other games that this would be similar to? Actually, another one that we talked about today, Terraforming Mars, would be okay. an excellent choice. Um, you're placing tiles down on the board, and you're working on resources. So 
Also, um, I think Architects of the West Kingdom would be a good choice. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's pretty good. If you like games with a lot of resource management and a lot of different strategies that you can employ, mm -hmm. simple mechanics but complex strategy. Uh, how much player interaction really is there? Um, you're interacting with each other on the outposts. Okay. But other than that, you're also trying to collect different bonuses along the tracks. And the first person to collect um, certain bonuses will be the only person to collect certain buildings for mm -hmm. their but capital you city. you can't go in and kick over people's castle. You can't kick over their capital city, but you can start taking over other people's outposts sure. and okay. removing their bonuses okay. that they were getting. Sure. Uh, so this is also a civilization game. How does it compare to the other civilization games? Like, you know, we were just talking about you know, Europa Universalis um, on Kickstarter right mm. now. But there's also like Advanced Civ and some of the other yeah. civilization building games that seem like very detailed and very micromanaging. Sure. Um, where does this sit, kind of sit on that spectrum? Well, it's got kind of an engine building feel to it, mm -hmm. but it ends up being more of a tableau builder. Okay. Because you're building out a city and you'll get certain points on this little grid system that you have if you finish out a column or you finish out a row. Sure. It's a lot of things all at once. So it dips its toes into a lot of a variety of different mechanics. Good. And with the size and like scope of the game, I would put it towards the heavier end of okay. gaming. Great. I would like Euro games and stuff like that. Great. Definitely not a game for a younger audience. It it requires so start with Funko, go straight to Tapestry, no. then Dune. <laughs> no, not at all. No. Oh gosh. Um, it, it, you do have simple actions, but there's so many different icons that you sure. have to learn okay. what they do, um, what your civilization does, and how your income works, and end of game scoring. So, if you're planning on you know sitting down for a couple hours, maybe even a little bit more than that, that's that's the time to pull out Tapestry and get a couple of your right. friends to come over and really commit to playing it. Great. Well, what else? What's next? So I'm gonna pull out my favorite pick from the games that I. Dune. Brought today, I, I know you're. I know you're a big fan of Dune, Derek. Sorry, this one's gonna be Circadian's First Light. And can you, can you venture a guess as to why you think this one might be? Oh, uh, it's got dice. Favorite? Yeah, it's got yep. so much dice. Oh, you know what? It's got tons of dice. I have a Dune dice game we need to play. Oh, well. You and me, we're gonna. All right. Our yeah. Our Venn diagrams sometime. are coming together. All right. Cool. Um, hopefully, it's a little different than Circadian's well, that's, First Light. Well, that is. It's a face. Yeah, it's a it's a weird alien race. One of the three races that uh, the Circadians found as they traveled to this new world. Okay. So what you're doing is um, everybody is a space explorer commissioned yeah, I know. by I'm a space explorer. You're a space explorer. They're a space explorer. Okay. Uh, I, if you say so, yep. I, I don't remember ever going to space or being in a rocket or anything like that. I'm definitely not trained to be a space explorer, but you are in your heart, though. I, I do play a lot of Space Base. See, there you go. My favorite game ever, so <laughs> maybe I am. Um, but in this game, everybody is a Circadian, which is uh, somebody who is sort of commissioned to go to this new planet, foster peace and harmony with the other people, while also harvesting as much crap yep, from the, I was from wondering the when planet that was as they possibly like, can. Sounds good, sounds good. <laughs> Like trying not to anger anybody and while understanding they while we just like tap the ridiculously planet for free resources. exploit the natural resources. Yeah, exactly. Got it. <laughs> Got it. And the way you do that is with dice. Capitalism with dice. Yes. So everybody gets their own base of operations. She knows what's up. He's all like, "Yep, we're signing this peace treaty," <laughs> and she's all like, "We're getting the resources." Oh yeah, you know what we're after. <laughs> Yeah, so you get your own um, faction. And what you're doing is you've got like some farms that are going to give you certain bonuses when you take mm -hmm. actions. Uh, you've also got a screen and some dice. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're going to roll the dice behind that screen. You only get one roll. And then you place the dice on different actions. You can outsource those actions to do something on the planet, or mm -hmm. you can take those actions in your own special farm that you've got that's orbiting the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can get permanent resources, or sorry, um, some, some resources that will help you do lots of things throughout the game. Once you revealed your screen and all the actions that you've taken, you'll go around taking all the actions that you want. Um, certain actions will cost you crystals. Um, certain actions will cost you algae. Uh, and what you're doing is you're spending these resources to either change them into other resources or turn them in 
for victory points. You're trying to get lots of free up, sorry, not free upgrades. You're trying to get lots of upgrades for your main board so you don't have to spend as much algae to take the really difficult actions. I know that's always the problem I have is my algae expenditure is just way too high. <laughs> I guess it's probably, it's not really like a currency, but it's sort of like an energy source sure. Sure. Um, for the all the different technology that you're using to transport stuff mm -hmm. to and from the planet. Sure. So once you're done taking all these different actions with the dice, you'll also be going on to different boards and trading in these resources with the locals. And those mm -hmm. locals will give you victory points based on not the number on the die itself, but rather where you place it on the board, what resources you're willing to give up. Some of the resources are more valuable than others. So you might trade electricity, or you might trade some algae or some crystals. Um, however, this, this sounds like a very classic Euro trade empire building thing, except in space. Kind of. I would say it's very Euro, okay. definitely. Um, and you're doing a lot of trading and um, victory point management and stuff like that. Um, you're building out this sort of engine so that when you do take actions, they become better and better. Mm -hmm. um, However, there's a lot of dice manipulation as well. Sure. Uh, the more buildings that you place on your board, the more you can influence the dice that are on, um, well, the dice that you place onto your board. So mm -hmm. if you end up rolling a bunch of ones, well, you can place them on a building that lets it like boost it up by two or three. Sure. Um, so that you get like a higher number, which means you get to trade more resources. Or you've got this also this huge hex on the board where you're traveling along with your sort of this like ring, this hex ring. And as you take a certain action, you'll be able to move it a certain number of spaces equal to the number on the die that you placed. Mm -hmm. And as you move over different resources, you'll collect them. And wherever mm -hmm. you land, you'll get a huge bonus of resources. Okay. So maybe you're trying to move it around to different places where you know resources are going to be generated so that you can collect them and then trade them in later for victory points. Sure. Okay. But because people are going to be trading victory points, oh, sorry, trading in these resources so often, mm -hmm. if you follow somebody's action, and you try to get victory points for trading a certain resource that somebody al already has, or with a number on the die that somebody already used, you actually suffer some penalties. You won't get as many victory points. Mm -hmm. So you're really racing to get some of the really good stuff or trading some of the resources, the really good ones, mm -hmm. as soon as possible. OK, cool. It's a very highly complex game, um, but the actions that you take are very, very intuitive. Well, so it also does sound like there's uh, a fair amount of player interaction right. in the sense of you choosing when to sell things to influence how much it's going to benefit other people. Exactly. Kind of reminds me of like Puerto Rico or something like that. Yeah. Right? You have to manage what other people are going after so that they don't take the, the market stuff away from you mm -hmm. first. You have to manage what victory points or resources you're going to trade in mm -hmm. or what number on the dice you're going to be placing down and try to do that before your opponents do so that you can get the maximum benefits and mm -hmm. bonuses for those things. You also have certain cards that you can take that will change win conditions, at least for victory points, mm -hmm. instead of like Gen different ways to generate victory points. Yes, yeah, so different okay. ways to generate victory points. Okay. Um, and then of course the board on the table. Well, you're not the only person who's trying to explore different locations. Mm -hmm. So other people might be collect um, scooping up those different resources sure. before you get a chance to exploiting them before you. I mean, really? Exactly. How rude! How rude! Uh, so, are there specific games that you think this is similar to? It's kind of tricky. Um, I would say if you've ever played Roll for the Galaxy or Race for the Galaxy, yeah, you're yeah. rolling dice behind a screen just like in Roll mm -hmm. for the Galaxy, and you're trying to build out, but you're not collecting planets. You're really just trying to collect resources and trade them in. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really, well, thematically, you're doing politics with the alien races, and you're trying to garner peace and stuff like that. But in reality, you're really just placing dice on a board sure. and hoping that nobody else has already done that. And, you're trying. You're gonna like make them angry by forcing them to trade resources. So, so it's like an engine. It's an engine building, yeah. dice placement, economic game. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many dice are in it? Let's see. Is this was is this like the objective measurement of how much you like a game? Oh man. Um, if there are a lot of dice in it, I, I would say usually games that only have like two or three dice, dice are really fifty-two dice. Thing. Yeah, but this one has a ton of dice, and they're specific to each like faction that you play mm -hmm. with. So you'll, you'll get your own special color of dice. My favorite is red, but you might want to choose like yellow or blue or green or whatever. So um, 
I give this game like a 10 out of 10 in my book. Ten, I, 10 dice out of 10 dice. 10 dice out of 10. Um, I did get a chance to play it. I think it's really fun. Mm -hmm. It ends up being very complex, but I was able to learn it pretty quickly, even with the vast amount of stuff that's going on on the board, because you have to learn all the icons and stuff like that. But afterwards, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Great. Definitely highly recommend it. I think it. we have two games left. Yes. Let's see how quickly we can get through them. So I did say Happy Halloween at the start, uh, and I did bring some spooky games. Even though ha Halloween was yes yesterday, I do want to talk about some spookier stuff. This one is called Gates of Delirium. This is a, another renegade game um, designed as a competitive horror game. This is very different from most horror games because Almost all of the horror games that I've played end up being very, very cooperative because mm -hmm. for some reason horror just brings people together. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this game, you are tasked with collecting victory points in one of two ways. Murdering people. Murdering people. Yeah, nailed it. By unleashing monsters and monstrosities um, all over the world by opening these gates or... Oh, so this is, this is one of those games where you're playing the cultists. Kind of. Okay. Or the exact opposite. You Murdering can, people. No. <laughs> by sending investigators to do research and remove the monsters from the world and saving all the people. You're doing both. You don't Wait have to choose minute. to be a good person or a bad person. I feel like this is called job security. They release the monsters and they're like, oh, the uh, ghosts got out, but we've yeah. got some Ghostbusters. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty funny when you think about it uh, thematically, but in game, Really what you're doing is you're deciding, based on the cards that you have, what's better, to use the sane version or to go with the insane version. If you're going with the sane version, you're playing these cards out onto the board, these investigators that are going to give you victory points based on where you're going to place them out onto the board and the amount of victory points that they're, they're going to collect if you have the majority of them in certain locations. Mm -hmm. If you flip the cards over, and I don't mean like flip over, I mean like rotate them, you'll have mysterious little um, notes and excerpts from old texts and things like that. Or you'll have these gate cards. And once you build out a gate um, by placing down a certain number of these gate cards that will form a picture, if you place enough of them in a spiral, mm -hmm. then you'll earn a different set of victory points as well. So you're trying to collect like sets of certain colors of cards for the gates when you're playing the insane version, or you're trying to collect a bunch of quotes. So or it's, it's like two different excerpts and things like two that. Two different set collection mechanics. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's a set, it's a set collection game. Yes. Okay. Um, you're also trying to win ma the majority of different places. So if somebody else is getting really close to taking over a place, you might be like, okay, well I could play the sane version, but I wouldn't be able to fortify any of my numbers on that location. So instead, I'm going to do the insane version, and now nobody's going to be able to play any of their investigators to that location. And, and, we, take it and when we say places, yeah. there's a map here that basically seems like vaguely fantasy New England. Yeah. Okay. It's, um, it's in the Arkham setting, so it's got lots of uh, Lovecraftian uh, themes going on with yeah. like the well, sanity like, to and be, insanity. To be clear, like th this is Renegade, so it's not Fantasy Flight. Right. So this isn't the Arkham Horror setting. Right. This isn't that. Like it's in the Arkham setting in the sense that like it uses kind of Arkham terms. Yes. But there's no real one Arkham setting. Yeah. It's just kind of a grab bag they're pulling from. The themes and Got the it. feel, like the atmosphere, is going to give a lot of the the sane insane cards. Similarity. Um, kind of reminds me of mechanics from Lovecraft Letter. Oh, that. yeah, I love Love Cry Letter. Yeah. Uh, in that game, you're playing basically Love Letter, mm -hmm. but there's an insane version of every card, and if you get that one, you go insane. So, yeah, kind of the similar thing here, except you're not going to corrupt yourself when you mm -hmm. play these cards. You just decide when it's a good idea to play a certain card or another. And it really doesn't get too complicated. So I, I ended up really liking this one when I tried it out because it ended up being something where it, it was kind of like a tug of war. I knew that I was going to get a lot of points in an area, so I didn't feel like I needed to worry about it too much mm -hmm. until it went all the way around the table. And by, th by the end of that round, everybody had taken over that location that I thought it was super secu secure in. Thankfully, 
I'd earn points in different areas by playing those gate cards or mm -hmm. playing those you know excerpts mm -hmm. cards that are going to give me points in different ways. So you, you never feel too pigeonholed into cool. one strategy. Uh, this also sounds like of the games we have, this might be one of the lighter ones, one yeah. of the simpler ones. Definitely, I wouldn't say it's like super super no. easy or anything. It doesn't like sound that. like an entry game, but it sounds like it's certainly less complicated than say Tapestry, Absolutely. Lift Off, things like that. Yeah, I could recommend this to people who really like horror games but don't want to play something mm -hmm. super in depth. Uh, any other games that you think this would be very much like? It's tough because it's a co competitive horror game, and you don't see a lot of those these days. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you like Lovecraft Letter, or if you like Love Letter, it ends up being a lot similar to that. Or if you like any of the other Renegade games, and Renegade has done a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. like Fox in the Forest, or any of the like um, Architects of the West Kingdoms or Paladin West Kingdoms, stuff like that. Um, th they typically have done really well in the past with hiring really good designers. Um, so if you like the the art of any of the Arkham horror games mm -hmm. or any like Lovecrafty and stuff, then I would definitely check it out if you want something. What's a the little spite bit level? I mean, it sounds like you had a plan and then the table screwed you over. So yeah. high spite? Pretty high. Okay. Yeah, I'd say it's uh, on the higher end of spite, uh, especially considering that a lot of times you have to uh, decide between messing with somebody and and trying to bump them from first place to last place. Or trying to further your own goals and collect the cards. Oh, I think that you we want. know what we'll choose. Yeah, I think I think I know what you'll choose. <laughs> All right, so the last game we have last today game. is Paranormal Detectives. So it, this game, man, I know I said Circadian's First Light is my favorite one, but this one's probably like one of my second favorite one. I was so excited to play this game after I tried it out at PAX. This is more of a party game. It's sort of a mystery game. Well, the art, the art certainly seems to support that. Yeah, it's it's got really nice characters. I really like the designs of it. So what you're looking at here are screens that everybody's going to be hiding their notes behind because this is a mystery game. It's asymmetric. Uh, it's got Whoopi Goldberg. It's got Whoopi Goldberg <laughs> as a nun, <laughs> um, in which one player is a ghost, somebody who's died. You recognize hmm. this kind of thing I've heard from this Mysterium. Pitch uh, that's not that's not a tournament legal Ouija board. No, it's not. It's designed specifically for this game. It's a mystery game in which you're trying to figure out how the Glad ghost somebody got that. How the ghost died. Um, really? Yeah. One person's the ghost, and a bunch of other people are trying to figure out how the ghost. Yeah, died? it's just like Mysterium. Huh. So in this game, the person who's the ghost is trying to help everybody figure out how they died. Everybody else is just detectives, like the name of the game states. Um, what you're doing is it comes with a shoelace. Those are ropes, and I'll explain those in a second. <laughs> these, are, these are called shoelaces, my friend. Everybody else is trying to gather ghost clues to tie his shoes. from the ghost, who can't just tell them what happened. So instead, you're going to be using these cards that will give you clues from the ghost. The ghost will do lots of different really fun and interesting things. Like tie your shoelaces. Like tie your shoelaces, OK. So. <laughs> Um, so for instance, I might play a card and I'll ask the ghost a question. I'll, I'll say something like, ghost, why did you, uh, why did the murderer kill you? Or something like that. And the ghost will, um, if I play the ghost touch card, the ghost will actually come up behind me and draw the answer on my back with their finger. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> so so this is a game that we're going to have to discuss boundaries mm -hmm, when playing. Mm -hmm. So you might want to take that card out if you don't like it, but I love it. I think it's fun. I think it's awesome. Um, and so they might draw like a word, or they might draw something like a, uh, this is very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> or they might draw like a, a picture of the weapon that they used or something like that. Is that? I have no idea what that is. It just feels like you're just like <laughs> running your finger on my back, like right. some weird ghost massage or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weird ghost massage is what this game should be called, apparently. But there uh, are other cards, too. Yeah. I have a feeling that we're harping on one individual card. <laughs> um, like, for instance, the Whispers of Shadows, where the ghost will mouth a word or something like that to try to get you to guess okay. what they're saying. Or they might use the Ouija board, and they'll place these different tokens the down. The Waluigi board. No. It's, it's, it's a Ouija board <laughs> where they place different tokens down um, where you don't know exactly which letter they're using, uh -huh. um, but they do, you do know which three letters it could be and mm -hmm. which letter in the five letter word that they're making or less that they're trying to make. Okay. So if I was trying to make you guess something like plant, I would put this one over 
where the P is, but you don't know if I'm talking about the B or the V or the P. Um, could, have, could have been Bant. Um, sure, I, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't advise using that kind of <laughs> obtuse <laughs> reasoning logic, but sure, why not? Um, you keep advising people to not play games terribly, which is kind of counter to this whole thing I'm doing here of just being a traitor. I can see that you have your very unique way of playing board games, Derek, and I respect oh, it. Good. I'm glad. I just I'm don't glad. think the vast majority I, I, I of board gamers. I just don't think anybody else ever wants to play that <laughs> way. Will want to play that way. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's lots of different cards. So um, you've got like this meter where you can rate things on, on a scale of big to small so is this or hot to cold. No. Okay. It is a competitive game where everybody's trying to figure out the mystery. It's trying to solve it. So you need to figure out five things. Who the murderer was, why they ended up killing you, or the ghost. Um, Where, the loca how, location, yes. How, um, the, the delivery method, right? And knife. And weapon, what murder weapon was used. <laughs> I feel like I have to like, keep reining you in <laughs> as you just like, go with like, these wild claims of yep, that, what things can and can't be. That's our dynamic. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, you're going to be taking notes with these little dry yeah, erase like, markers. So it looks like everybody gets their own dry erase. That's what the screens are for, thing. to hide your answers. Is, and at the is, end... Is this for like Dracula to write you an invite or something like that? That's actually one of these special cards where the ghost will actually take your hand and the pen that you have in it and draw something to answer the question that you've asked. Okay. Um, but it'll be very weird because you're... Like probably because using somebody you're, else's. You're touching your friend, and that's gross. No, I mean, if you can suspend some disbelief for like a little bit, you can just pretend that a ghost is controlling your hand and making you draw things. Yeah, but then you'd be so <laughs> sad because you have to pretend your friend is dead. I, I mean, I don't know. It's it's a board game. Just pretend <laughs> that it's somebody you don't know. I I don't know what to tell you, dear. <laughs> so wh whoever, because like. You know, you're going to be getting information over yeah. the course of the game. Um, right. Each player, do they know the information the other players uncover? Well, some things are more obvious than others. Sure, so, like, for instance, if we're using the Ouija board or anything that's out on the table, everybody's going to be able to see it. But that ghost massage yeah. is just you and the ghost. <laughs> exactly. So some things... <laughs> or maybe <laughs> just the ghost, because it's impossible to figure out. Some things, some crucial information, you, want, you might want to hide that from other players. But also, it's tougher to use that information because, as you just saw, it's really hard for me this to understand what you're trying to draw. It's a real interesting back. party game, and uh, I can see that there are a lot of people I would never want to play this game with. I really enjoyed it the first time I got yeah. to play it, and I can't wait to play it again because so, I love the mystery solving. Well, so the, the players, were, well, the, the investigators will win by guessing, right? Exactly. But at the how end does of your the turn, ghost win? at the end of your turn. If you are able to guess all five of the different aspects of the story correctly, you win. If you the do it wrong, are you just killed? Loses if nobody guesses it right by the, by the time everybody goes through all the cards in their deck. Okay. And everybody has to take out a certain number of cards, so nobody, no, not everybody's going to have the same number of cards to play. Okay. Uh, so does the ghost, is, is it the ghost and the investigator win if the investigator guesses? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, the ghost's job is to, to, just to do the best they can. <laughs> so the ghost wants to not lose, as soon as possible. the investigators want to win. Yeah. And then I assume you then rotate the role of ghost or something? I mean, if you play it multiple times, you ha you are free to decide how you want the distribution of who wants to be the ghost. Free up. to decide what rules we want to use? Sure. Yes. Is that a reference to something? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the end of your turn, you get to guess. And if you're right, you're right. But if you're mm -hmm. wrong, the ghost will actually tell you how many things you got right. They just don't. They just don't tell you what you were right about and what you were wrong about. Mm -hmm. And they'll also do that secretively, so everybody will know you got at least something wrong, or you got at least something right, or some combination of those things. Mm -hmm. There's also a cooperative variant where everybody can actually work together. Everybody's working on the same team, and the better you do, the sooner you're able to guess it. The fewer cards you have to play in order to get to the answer, mm -hmm. the more points you'll get, or the better rating you'll get. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to play it competitively, although I prefer it that way, just because it ends up being a deduction game where you're using information other people are getting as well as the information that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Information other people offering up versus the stuff that you're curious about. You know, you might be like 
wondering what the murder weapon is because it kind of looks like a gun, but could also be a shoe. And you're not really sure what's falling out of it. Is that bullets or is that just I mean, like Maxwell somebody Smart dumped could something be a out gun of it? shoe, right? So when somebody else guesses gun, you're like, oh, okay, well, some, at least somebody else is on the same track as I am. Maybe it's a gun. Maybe I'll guess that the next time it comes it's around. It's a weird uh, slice of a tarot deck, too. Yes. Uh, one of the cards you can play will have the ghost using tarot cards. And if you don't know what tarot cards are or what the significance is, in the back of the rule book, it actually explains all of them in the way they want you to use them in this game. Sure. Yeah, so it's sort of so, like a faux tarot deck. Aside from Mysterium, mm -hmm. What other games is this like? If you like that sort of like asymmetric feel to it, um, you might want to try like Code Names or some other spooky mm -hmm. themed games, right? The if you like Werewolf, the or new Obscurium deduction maybe? games, it's it's not exactly the same as trying to figure out who's, you know, who is. A, there's no hidden roles or anything mm -hmm. like that, but you are trying to dis, like solve mysteries. So mystery solving games, oh excuse me, um, like Sherlock Holmes and things like that, mm -hmm. or um, Chronicles of Crime, another uh, Lucky Duck game, then I would definitely check uh, some of those games well, out. I mean, it also, like, we, we are often very flippant and dismissive of it, but it, it also seems a lot like a party game version of Clue. Yeah, absolutely. So, so if you loved Clue as a, as a child, definitely. Uh, I suspect that this is going to have uh, uh, tickle some of that same itch. Yeah, or absolutely. Massage some of that same ghost. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it definitely has a lot of the same notes uh, the way Mysterium does. Uh, solving that mystery, trying to figure out who done it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a it's a caper game. It's definitely a really good party game. Um, so if you have like a with, bunch of people with over, the right it, people. it's pretty easy to teach people and you know pr try to go over what the different cards do before. How complex do you think it is? It's actually it seems, really simple. Because it seems like this might be a really good kind of party deduction game for kids. Um, the only problem is it it's got a lot of suggestive themes when it comes to murder and death. So that's you don't, what. You don't think murder and death is appropriate for children? I think families yeah. are going to have to decide for themselves what's appropriate for their children. I don't think I'm in the position to do that. <laughs> um, uh, but it's also a simple game. So if you end up playing this with your family and things like that, if you know a lot about how people have died in the past or if you have experiences with those kinds of things, the stories are based on not real life scenarios, but what we can conceive would happen in real life sometimes. So it's more as seen on TV. Sure, kind of. Yeah, if you can conceive that it could possibly happen in reality and somebody could die. You know, it's a lot of like, whatever you've seen on like TV shows or movies, those kinds of deaths, it plays on a lot of cliches and tropes and stuff like that. Cool. Definitely recommend that one. Well, thank you for bringing all these with you. Thank you for I having think me. We ended up uh, jibber jabbering a lot about a lot of these at great length. I hope you enjoyed that. I do. I love talking about board games. Uh, thank you for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to say about any of these games, yourself, Mox, Halloween, your love of dice? All of these games are available at Mox Boarding House. We are a board game store. We have two locations, actually three locations, two fully built. One of them that we're still renovating mm -hmm. um, will be available in Portland come next year. Um, we are also in Ballard and Bellevue. Uh, it's a huge board game store. You can find all of these and more. And not just board games, miniature games, uh, trading card games like Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. And we also have like a cafe and a restaurant. So you know, it's a great place to hang out for Thanksgiving if you don't have anybody to hang out with. Well, not Thanksgiving, but like around Thanksgiving, we'll be having sort of like um, fun, exciting events for people to come and hang out and meet new people with and stuff like that. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me again. Mm -hmm. I always had fun. I missed you last time I came by, but I'm glad you're back. Well, I'm sure Emma did a great job. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she didn't, doesn't bring the backstabbing, but maybe no. you didn't need to rein her in quite as often. <laughs> no. Emma, Emma is one of my favorite people, so I really enjoyed hanging out with her. But thank you for letting me hang out mm -hmm. with you, too. I, yep. I had a lot of fun with you guys. We need to play uh, Dune sometime. Yeah, that'd be really fun. Show me your dice version or whatever it is. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, remember that we will be back next week on Friday at 11 a.m. for Table Takes. We will then have new release, new release rundown for that week. Uh, I think Will is going to come on camera again for that one. Uh, and then on Monday nights, we have the Brothers Murph starting at 5 p.m. Pacific. And at noon Pacific on Wednesdays, we have Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Uh, he won't be this coming week, I believe. I believe he's off, but then he'll be back the following week.
Uh, so we've been still going through people with magic. I think they had Richard Garfield on a couple weeks ago. We had uh, the president, a uh, current president of Gen Con, David Hoppy on. Ooh. So it was very weird to have a cycle of like, David Hoppy is my boss. And yeah. like his boss was interviewing him about the last time he was his boss. It was wow. a, it was a cycle of bosses that was ridiculous. Anyway, you should join <laughs> us for that or go check out the um, the video on demand on YouTube and everything. So thanks for joining us. I hope that you saw something interesting this week. And uh, let us know what you're playing. Join us again. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.